Hello, everyone. My name is Nick. Uh, I am a fifth year here at Cal Poly. Uh, I have many names uh, um, as to what I do with White Hat. Uh, some people say White Hat grandparent, some people say officer alumnus, and some people say that dude who sits around the lab a bunch who really needs to graduate or at least work on his thesis. Uh, many names all mean the same thing. And today I'm going to talk to you about operating systems. So we are going to be digging in into some, a topic that I find incredibly fascinating and we're going to be looking specifically at uh, some of the security implications, not just of the, the most common operating systems, but across the board operating system design. And so if we really want to understand where these operating systems came from, why these systems are the way they are, we need to start back at the beginning in the primordial dust of the 1960s, before which there was no time, because as we all know, uh, Unix time starts in 1970. So before that, basically nothing existed. But among the primordial dust were these mainframes. These things, thank you. Uh, these things were absolutely a pain to work with. So uh, some of you who have uh, either taken a, taken a 357 class with me or done some debugging frequently complain to me about me making you use uh, the text-based debugger. I would like to point you to the person on the left <clears throat> who's currently debugging a mainframe with an oscilloscope. That is the most metal thing I've seen in a long, it's like, oh look, this, Clearly my computation is wrong because the wave is going a little bit too wavy right over. You can tell I have no idea how an oscilloscope works <laughs> from that description. But like the things go, the, the waves go wavy and then sometimes they're too wavy and that's when you're wrong. That's when you have a bug. So these mainframes were massive. They were often owned entire one, just one for a whole room just for one. And the big problem they had is you could really only do one thing at a time on them. So the general idea is if you were someone who wanted to schedule some, uh, like schedule some scientific computation, you'd go over to the mainframe room, you'd give them your big stack of punch cards that you punched out and say, run my code. And they would say, neat, get back to you in 48 hours, probably. If you, if you were high up, you got like 48 hours. Um, but basically, run my code, and they would wait for the machine to be ready to run, you drop the punch cards in, they'd run, and this was pretty much like the most basic levels of computation where it was literally load a process, so load up a program, jump, so go to the first instruction, so the first assembly instruction, uh, and just start going. And just go and hope that it like printed something out at some point, or signaled a stop, or didn't have a bug that just had it go on a random excursion throughout the like program's memory or any of that. It was, there was no real, and similarly, debugging programs, what happened was after 48 hours, you got your, your printout, and the printout said dot, 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 dot. It was like, this is not my scientific computation, this is an ASCII art of a middle finger. And probably your bug isn't actually that exciting, it's probably just like a bunch of random stuff all over a page, sort of like what happens when you like open a binary file, but it was just random, it wasn't anything meaningful. And so debugging these things were a nightmare. Also you had to wear suits to use them, which is unfortunate because I enjoy the fact that I can now Google things in my pajamas. So. The true beginning of operating systems really come from uh, these two gentlemen. This is Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. Uh, <clears throat> Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie worked at Bell Labs, which is now known as AT&T. But back in the 60s, Bell Labs was actually the like really cool place to do computer research. They were the people like at the cutting edge of computer science research. They were doing all the, all the like algorithms you hear of and all the neat stuff that came out of the, the 60s and 70s computing revolution mostly came from Bell Labs or its associates. So these two guys were working on the Multics project. So Multics is an operating system. It is a giant collaboration between Bell Labs, MIT, Caltech, all of these huge names. and There was a ton of prestige around the Multics project. It was going to be the thing that solved the current computing problems, that made processing faster, cheaper, 
easier to use. There was going to be a computer in a computer terminal in every home. Now, unfortunately, they had the slight problem that Multics was trash. Absolute trash. Uh, and the reason for that was because it was being created by a giant committees. Each of these big organizations carved out their piece that they wanted to work on. So, for example, uh, MIT said, I want to work on the user input. And they just carved that out and said, cool, we're going to do it our way. And Bell Labs was like, cool, we're going to carve out the file system. And nothing communicated. No one knew what anyone did. There was no, all the a bunch of commands would do redundant things. So you'd have like the file system commands that would do some kind of network, uh, not networky stuff because there wasn't that kind of networking, but you have file system commands like read some user input, or you have user input commands that like would try to schedule things. It was, there was these massive amounts of overlap and the project was kludgy, it was impossible to work with. Now, eventually in, the, in 1970 uh, or 1968, Bell Labs decided to pull out of the project. Now that did not mean the death of Multics. Multics was finished. Eventually enough money was just thrown at this thing that it came to life. And if you go to this website, you can SSH into a working Multics mainframe today. Like it is still running. It is still kept alive for some reason. I'm not sure why. But in 1968, everyone was like, everyone at Bell Labs was like, this is awful. I hate doing this, let's move off this project. And so Ken Thompson, who was heading up the uh, Multics operating system development, specifically the file system development, uh, decided to pull out of the project, or his manager decided to pull out of the project, and he went back to working on just generic computing things. Now, while he was working on his generic computing things, he wrote this little game called Space Travel. And this game was written entirely in assembly, and it was a high intensity game. You could like take off from a planet and like land on another planet and take off from that planet and land back on Earth. It was pretty legit. It was, it was one of actually the more fun mainframe games. Some of these mainframe games were some of the dullest things in the world. And this is a screenshot from it. I don't know what's happening in this screenshot, but it is a screenshot from it. So, excitement! If you want to talk more about actually interesting video games, next week will be things that like are actually kind of playable. So, but anyways, this game was uh, running on the Bell Labs mainframe. So the GCOS mainframe, it was a very large, very powerful computer. And again, because they were trying to divvy up resources, as a department, <clears throat> if you wanted to use the computer, it came out of your department budget. So if you wanted to play a game of space travel, you had to allocate $75 out of your department budget for one game because it what took all these computational resources. And so what they sort of realized was this doesn't make any sense. Why are we trying to um, play $75 games that are still just like mildly entertaining? So they're like, okay, cool. We are going to port this space travel game that's written entirely in assembly. And keep in mind, this was back when like assembly was a different, like a different, every computer had slightly different languages. So this was pretty much just like almost a complete ground up rewrite of the game. Uh, they were going to move this to a PDP-7. PDP-7 was a personal microcomputer and it was called a microcomputer because it was only about the size of this screen instead of an entire room. So, and uh, they were like, oh yeah, we have this random PDP-7 just kind of sitting around Let's port uh, space travel to it. Okay, so we want to move space travel. Well, first thing we need to do is be able to display graphics. We need graphics for games. Well, unfortunately, the PDP-7 was kind of garbage. The software that ran on it was pretty garbage. All the software that was written for it was inefficient, it was expensive, it ended up costing a bunch of computational resources. And in a world where like, you're talking about like, on the on the speed of kilohertz processors, like insanely slow chips, you really needed to eke every piece of performance out of this thing you could. And so they're like, okay, the graphics libraries on this thing suck. Throw them out, rewrite them. 
OK, cool. So if we want to rewrite the graphics libraries, we need to rewrite the mathematical libraries. OK, cool. So we'll write some mathematical libraries and some graphics libraries. Well, we have this neat file system that we were working on for Multics. Well, shoot, let's just slap that on to uh, there because we want to be able to save files so that we can have game saves. Oh, well, shoot, now we're trying to port this file system. Ah, uh, this is a pain. I have to put all of these punch cards into the machine. Uh, let's write an assembler. Let's write something that we can write, like text-based assembly, and, and bring that down to the, the machine code that the computer can understand. All right, cool. Well, if we've got an assembler, let's let's put a debugger on it so that way we can, you know, see what's going on with uh, with the different symbols. And on and on and on. And all of a sudden, there was an operating system. Like, I'm not kidding you. This entire operating system was built from the idea of I want to play space travel, so I guess I'll write an operating system. <laughs> These are the kind of things that people were paid to do at Bell Labs. It's why I wish I could work there, because it sounds wonderful. But now that place is AT&T, so no. Um, <laughs> so um, anyways, we had this, uh, we had this giant, uh, this new thing that was created. And they had to come up with a name for this new operating system. And this operating system was called Unix. Now, Unix was a pun on the name for uh, Multics. And it was entirely designed around the counter philosophy to Multics, where Multics was large, kludgy, big pieces that did large things. Unix was small. It was every single piece of this system should do exactly one thing and be excellent. <laughs> be excellent at doing it. Um, it, should really, it should be very easy to write a tool for this that does one thing, and that one tool should be composable. This was the other half of this, small and composable. And the idea of composable is if I take one tool, I can take the output for that and put it into the input of another tool. This is a central design feature, not just to Unix, but to many, like basically a lot of program design nowadays, which is make small things that you can put together and have them be interoperable between each other. That's the, the thesis behind the command line, if you ever use that, why everything is text, is so that you can easily take the text from one program and put it into the text for the other. So we have this, this guiding philosophy, this general idea of how best can we do things in this operating system. And from this, like a whole, a whole world built around it. Now, unfortunately, you cannot run Unix. Unix is dead. Uh, it was, I think the last copy of it was sold in the early 2000s, late 1990s, but it is like dead as a doornail, completely dead. So why am I up here ranting about a dead operating system? Well, because uh, literally every operating system except one is derivative from Unix. Like all of them. So <clears throat> here's, how, here's how this all went down. The Unix operating system, once it was created, was actually very difficult to sell outright. And the reason was because in the 1970s, uh, after the operating system was moved into the new high-level language invented out of Bell Labs called C. Um, <clears throat> I know, C was awesome back then. It was the portable assembler. You could like not have to rewrite all of your code for every machine. It was so nice. And now it's a pain. Um, but it had just been written, and uh, at and was like, yes, I want to sell it. I want to make some money from this. But they had just been in an antitrust uh, lawsuit that basically was like, no, you can't sell software to. You're doing too much. Uh, we're not really a fan of what's going on here. And so a lot of these copies of the original Unix source code were kind of just like mailed out to universities with like a nice little letter from Ken Thompson, like, hope you enjoy the Unix or whatever. There's like these little handwritten notes from him sent to like, uh, Berkeley or some of the other sources. And so what we end up having is now this case of um, this software is adopted and modified in a bunch of different places. So I mentioned Berkeley. In one place, it went off to Berkeley, 
it was added uh, where they were experimenting with computer networking, the idea of hooking two computers up to each other and trying to send information over long distances. Um, this was later what uh, developed the internet-based uh, interfaces that you use today in almost all modern uh, operating systems. And it evolved into what was called the BSD, or the Berkeley Software Distribution. This was later refined and refined and worked on. It itself split off into multiple groups, one of which was called FreeBSD, a free open source implementation of, of BSD. Now that FreeBSD was grabbed by a small fruit-based computer company uh, that later grew into making the Mac OS. The Mac OS is derivative of FreeBSD. And so you can trace Mac OS all the way back up to Unix. Now, somewhere else, in a different part of the world, Unix went off to a, uh, uh, a university with a guy by the name of Andrew Tannenbaum. Now, Andrew wrote a system based on Unix called Minix, which is something that you can actually use here at Cal Poly to this day. It's a learning operating system. And it's awful. Oh, God, is it awful. It is slow and uncomprehensible, and the code is so confusing. And this, annoyed, and this annoyed people. This actually annoyed one Finnish hacker so much that he said, screw this, I am writing my own operating system. It's going to be better, it's going to be bigger, it's going to do all the things. Now this Finnish hacker's name was Linus Torvalds, and he created Linux, the Unix that is the Unix derivative that is now one of the most common operating systems behind Minix. Minix is the most common operating system in the world, um, but Linux is the second most. Maybe Mac OS, but probably Linux. Um, so it is derivative of all of these major, and all the smaller operating systems, if you've ever heard of Sun or uh, Solaris, uh, those projects, uh, those, uh, those operate, that whole group did their operating system. And so it's influenced all of OS design for pretty much like the entirety of time. And so it's incredibly important and we can understand why OSs are the way they are from this. So one of the big things that uh, of somewhat Multics and really Unix brought to the world was the idea of time sharing, which is I remember I mentioned earlier that these old mainframes, they'd run on one program at a time. Now the problem with that is Let's say that you have a program that like 95% of the time is just waiting for user input, like waiting for me to type something into the keyboard. And the other 5% of the time is just like doing math, like you're adding numbers or something. Now the problem with that comes, if I happen to be like out at lunch, then that program's just sitting on the mainframe, wasting cycles, being like, yep, still waiting for user input. Still waiting for user input. All right, cool. Um, <clears throat> and so what was more efficient was, can we develop a way to load multiple programs onto one mainframe and have the computer be able to schedule between those programs? So it'd say, OK, this program is waiting for user input, and this program over here is going to like do some math right now. OK, here's what I'm going to do. I, as the OS, am going to say, this process Go to sleep, just whoo. and it the process to the world to the process the world ends, and this process magically starts up again, and it starts running and doing its math and doing its math and doing its math, and then it hits a point where it needs user input, for example, and the OS is like, cool, this one wanted to read from the terminal again, whoo. there you go, and so we developed this system of sharing time between these various programs and trying to best schedule for them. And as a result of this, we are basically, we, as a combination of this and the fact that we don't really want to rewrite our programs. Like, I wrote, uh, what's a program I wrote recently? I recently wrote like Linear Sim. Well, people don't know what Linear Sim is anymore. I know you do. That's because you also need to graduate. Um, I wrote Moonlander. Yeah, there we go. So I recently wrote Moonlander. I don't want to have to rewrite Moonlander. I've done it. I don't need to move it to another language. And so if I want to upgrade my operating system, if I want to make my operating system do time sharing, but 
I have a program that is designed to be on its own in the OS, like by itself, I'm kind of screwed because it's going to be like, I have all the memory. Cool, I'm just going to write data all across it. And then my other programs will be like, well, I was using that. What the heck, buddy? Like, why would you do this to me? And so the solution we came up with is, OK, the OS is going to be the world's best liar. It is going to lie to every program running and say, you are the only program. You're special. You're the only program on this system. You're just, just have a wild time with memory. It's all yours. Oh, but just, just make sure to tell me before you use any memory. You know, just, just so that I know, just so that I know. Oh, and also, there's no hardware on this computer. It's just you and memory. It's just, you know, if you need like any user input or anything, just, just come chat with me. I, I, I got it. I'll take care of this. And so the, the solution that this came up with is our OS is now going to basically be the brain for all of these various different programs. It's going to keep them all in isolation. What it's going to avoid is any kind of snooping between programs. Because what we really do not want, and what we are deathly afraid of in a time-sharing operating system, is the idea that one process can see anything about another process that the OS doesn't want them to. The OS completely decides, you know about what happened, like anything outside of your little world, I have to know about, I have to be in control of. Nothing else. This is why uh, frequently um, uh, the OS uh, takes a very uh, negative approach to anyone. So I told you that they have, to, they have wide access to memory, but you have to tell the OS first. And if you don't, the OS will be like, ah, well, you, you broke my rules, so goodbye. Psh and just end the process right there. So the OS keeps a very, very tight hold on all of the processes. It tells them, this is your world. Have fun in it. Exist in it. Don't go outside it. If you need anything, come talk to me. That is the general idea that the OS is going for with time sharing, specifically so it can avoid any type of process isolation failures. Additionally, <coughs> the OS, it provides these services. So the OS says, OK, hey, like I said, if you need anything, do you need some files? I've got files. I've got a hard drive right here. Tell me what, the, what file you want, uh, and I will get it for you. Uh, the Unix file system that uh, Ken Thompson developed was the first hierarchical file system. So what that means is you could put a folder inside of another folder. This seems like a really, really arbitrary thing, but this was mind-blowing back in the day. Like, If you think about it for a second, try having all of your files on just one, imagine having every file on your computer in one folder. That would be awful, trying to navigate anything in that. Like, the fact that you could put folders inside of each other was awesome for organization. And it meant you could put the system files over here and your files over here. And then you could protect the system files with special privileges. And you could say, these ones are all fine. It was awesome. It's a really cool file system. And it is the center. Now. Remember how I said that the file system was the first thing that they put in after like, you know, like some basic graphics libraries? Well, uh, because most computer science is mostly spit and bailing wire, they were kind of like, well, we already have this wonderful file system. What if we just make everything a file? And so that's exactly what they did. And I'm not kidding you when I say everything is a file. You want to read from the network? Your, actual, your process thinks it's reading from a file. You want to interact with your temperature sensor that's been hooked up. That's a file. You want to get info about your process. You go read a special fake file system called PROC that you go and read these files and the OS when you ask, because remember, the only way you can read something is if you ask the OS, because if you want anything outside of memory, you got to ask them. And it's like, oh yeah, no, that file exists. Just go read it. And then it's like, cool, I like that file, please. And it's like, this is your process information. Here you go. It's very secret. It's like, yes, this is a file. It's not actually a file. There is no process information stored on hard disk. That would be insanely slow and really, really kludgy. But it would, um, but the, the computer, the process doesn't know anything different. And so these services become incredibly important and incredibly centric around the idea of files. So another big thing in OSs, in modern OS design, is the idea of these. Uh, common abstractions. This way of saying, I can say multiple different things 
are the same thing because a user input is basically just a really slow file that like you every once in a while you like read from the file and then you like black out for a second and you black back in and there's a new character there and you read that and then you black out for a second and you black back in and there's a new character and it's wonderful. Uh, can I make the mm. Yeah, uh, but anyways, uh, so the other thing that the OS gives you is protection of your hardware. <laughs> there are a lot of things in this world that could be very damaging to your hardware. <laughs> All kinds of strange, like, like, fire, electricity, beverages, food and beverages, like all of these can be insanely detrimental to uh, any kind of like electronics you have. And those kind of things, the OS cannot protect you from. These are things that are external to the computer and are not under the control of uh, the operating system. But for the longest time, there was one danger bigger than any of these things combined to the operating system. And that danger, was you, because you don't know how to work with hardware. Also, this is actually how I use an oscilloscope. And especially you will laugh because 20 minutes ago, I sent this picture to my friend who's an EE and he then informed me this is a voltmeter, not an oscilloscope. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. I am I am not good at the hardware. Um, Yes, so this is what I, also this is what I look like when I'm grading, uh, if anyone was curious. Um, but yeah, working with hardware is insanely difficult. Like, the fact that you can send bytes to a, like, I can write things to a, like, piece of, uh, piece of hardware, and as a result, that piece of hardware can catch fire. Like, that is a viable thing that could happen if I mess this up. And so the operating system says, hey now, it's all gonna be okay. I'm gonna handle the hardware. You just tell me what you want to write. Do just it's a file. It's a file. This this temperature or this uh this temperature sensor. You want to read from it? Just say you want to read. I'll do the reading. I'll do all the like complicated hardware things. Here's your data. It's like thank you, thank you, operating system. I appreciate that. Um, but hardware can get so hard that um can actually come back and bite you. So a lot of the times, uh, if you're, you're working with hardware, um, because below the operating system, as much as it doesn't want to admit it, there is hardware running. And there is lots of small optimizations, things that you'd think make your computer better, faster, uh, more powerful, but also can have some interesting security. And one of the best examples of that recently is Spectre Meltdown. So Spectre Meltdown is a bug currently in uh, Intel and AMD CPUs. So a couple small companies, nothing major, um, <coughs> that utilizes hardware optimizations that these companies use to be able to read, do exactly what we were most afraid of, which is to be able to snoop. It allows you to utilize certain hardware optimizations to read the memory of other processes. So I, as a process, can violate that process isolation. I can understand that there are other processes on the system and break into them. I can start reading their data. I can start exfiltrating things that they're doing, all within the bounds of uh, this computer. So the thing about this, though, like, this was in the news, like, what? A year ago, maybe at this point. So it's been patched, right? Meltdown has been patched. Spectre 1 has been patched in some operating systems. Spectre 2, the alternate variant, not only has it not been patched in any major operating system, it can't be. Given the Intel released solution, to the second variant of Spectre is to buy a new CPU. If you are not in a place to get rid of the current computer you are running on and remove the CPU, if you are on a long running machine, something you can't deal with, you're going to be vulnerable to Spectre for the rest of your execution time. These are the kinds of things 
that OS, is, OS security has to deal with. Because operating systems, because they're operating at this level, have an immense amount of power, but anything under them, if they can't account for it, what are you gonna do? There's no one else to turn to as a more secure, like there is no, I can, as a process, I can say, I trust the OS. The OS will be secure even if I might not be. But as the OS, you're in control, you're on your own. You are running everything. You are the bookkeeper that needs to keep all of the ducks in line. And if something under you can sur like supplant you and just start doing things without your knowing, what do you do? <clears throat> so, I don't know. Like, even if, so this time sharing thing, like, it doesn't work. We have found a basically unpatchable vulnerability in this time sharing thing. So like, should we still be using these? Well, you know, we still have this, this really nice common base. So we can say like, okay, sure, maybe I'm not getting, but like now I don't need to think about hardware. I can avoid a lot of these hardware vulnerabilities or I can avoid, av avoid a lot of these hardware problems of like breaking my operating system. And like everything's defined in terms of these really nice system calls. And I have this wonderful file abstraction, this common ABI and all, oh fuck, Bill, God damn it. This is Bill Gates. Um, he invented the one operating system in the world not derivative from Unix. It's a one called Windows. And again, we have the problem of like, there's only one of them. There's only one operating system. And it had to be the most popular consumer operating system in the world that's just completely different. Like, does not follow does not follow the Unix philosophy, does not believe in the same file abstractions. Just, if you need to, if you want to write platform specific, like if you want to write platform independent code, you either need to jump through a ton of hoops. Basically, you're going to either be using a library or you need to write two very different system, uh, system wrappers in order to properly interface. Uh, lit, uh, Windows, to their credit, has tried to introduce a little bit more of a Unix-y like interface it is slow as sin and works 70% of the time. It has all these weird like edge cases when you try to use anything that's not like a standard uh, kernel call. And so what you end up with is, all right, now we have the competing standards problem where as soon as you have two standards, this XKCD means that things are going to start snowballing means that people are going to try developing more standards, try to unify these. A perfect example of this is, um, <clears throat> for example, Java. Java is awesome. It runs on any platform, any architecture, any operating system. Oh wait, but now you have to write code for Java, which is different from C, which is different from Unix C, which is different from Windows C, which is different from C Sharp, which is Windows version of Java. And now we have how many languages in the world? Like hundreds thousands like this is a serious problem like the the standards problem is actually a major thing like the fact that people trying to unify standards most of the time have good intentions but end up just creating more problems and more of this insecurity and so the additional issue we get into is like now we don't even have a common base so this os thing is really not like it's really not working out for us in any any of the ways we intended so it's like this neutral thing that's just kind of running on our system. And then we get this. The security hydra that is backwards compatibility. Because Windows, and Mac or, and uh, Linux too, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Windows has this thing where it, it wants you to be able to run as much of your old code as possible. Because just like when we originally designed Unix, you don't want to rewrite your code. No, you already compiled that. I compiled that, turned it in, I don't need to think about it again. Except now I need to run it on a new operating system and with different parameters and, oh God, uh, emulate everything. Just make sure, make it all work. I, I don't have the source code anymore. It's been 10 years, no one commented any of it. No one knows how this code works. There's literally a comment at the top that says, God, um, what was it? Uh, when, I, when, when I wrote this code, only God and I knew how this worked. Now only God knows. Um, <laughs> Just ab abandon all hope, ye who enter. It looks like a literal ASCII picture of Dante's Inferno on top of it. It is not, don't make me recompile it, please. Let's just back emulate. And so as a result of that, 
we can run our code on Windows 7 from, uh, from XP, Windows NT, which means we're going to have, like, there's only so much we can do with patching. There's only so much we can avoid certain vulnerabilities. And if we're supporting old version, if we stop supporting those old versions, like when we, if we, when we stopped supporting Windows XP, for example, do you think that stopped any of the people who are still running Windows XP from running Windows XP? No. no. All they decided was, well, I guess I don't need security patches anymore. I'm good. <laughs> and so you have this, this really just every time you try to fix it by releasing a new version, like it just grows another head and it ends up snowballing. And again, I mentioned how a lot of operating systems are like duct tape, bailing wire. A lot of it comes from this backwards compatibility problem with the idea of, hey, we really like, need to support everything that has run on this before, so we're just going to slap stuff on top and not think about redesigning, thinking about how to re-engineer security into this. And I pick on Windows, but Linux has the same problem. Uh, their problems are a little more complicated. Like both of those system calls, or both of those, uh, that's that uh, library call and that constant have a very long history that if you want to know about, please come find me because I love, if you ask me about map 32 bit, I will give you like a good 30 minute talk about how, uh, how awful it is. It's really funny. Um, and then get s is literally a vulnerability in a function call. Like it is a vulnerability. If you want to just put a vulnerability in your code, just get s. Um, Yeah, or no, it's F get, ah, yeah, no, not F get S, gets. So, yes, gets is the, yeah, this one, not F get S. F get S is actually okay, um, because they fixed it, but gets is the one that is, like, literally a vulnerability in the, literally a vulnerability, yes. And it, in the manual page for that function, it says, don't use this, it's from an olden day when we didn't really know how security worked. So. Uh, basically, like, what's our solution here? Uh, I know what I'm doing. I'm going back to debugging with my oscilloscope. Because honestly, that's the only, this is the only person I've trusted in this entire presentation. So whoever the fuck is debugging a mainframe with an oscilloscope, this person maybe can save me. But like, what do we do? How do we like, how do we be optimized about this? And so we really run into this issue of like, it feels like modern operating system design has really passed security by. And a lot of it is because back when we were originally designing these things, we didn't think about security. We didn't consider the problems of it. And because we have these backwards, backwards compatibility and uh, the standards problem, it's probably going to be really hard to fix it. Like, it is going to take some, some serious innovation to solve this problem. And that is why OS operations, operating system security is one of the oldest fields. Uh, when security was first coming around, one of the first things they started looking at was operating systems, thinking about how can we make these better, how can we make these cooler. And so I really encourage y'all, if you have a head for these, like if you find it interesting to see these massive systems that have been built across time, that you start to wonder like, why is this constant named bitmap32 when it maps 31 bits? If that kind of thing interests you, if understanding those systems interest you, then the space of operating system security is going to be a really terrifying but absolutely awesome ride. And you're going to learn so much about why modern systems are the way they are, about why security has evolved to how it is today. And so I implore you, if you are at all interested, come talk to me, come talk to any of the wonderful white out officers, come talk to uh, Dr. Nico, who is a operating systems and security professor here. He knows more about this than I will ever. He's an amazing teacher. Um, talk to anyone. Like, this stuff's amazing. It really is. Does anyone have any questions? I know I just talked for a very long period of time. Okay. What's up? Why was Windows developed as not Unix? Like, why did it happen? Uh, why did Windows happen the way it did? Basically because, uh, so when Bill Gates and the other people at, who uh, went on to found Microsoft, also, I'm going to step out of frame for one moment so I can get coffee. 
uh, they basically decided we we feel like we can do this um, in a better way. We feel like we don't need to follow the file abstraction. So that was their big thing is they felt like they could do it better with something called handles. Handles are the like alternative construct in Windows. They're kind of like file point like file descriptors if you squint at them really really hard. Uh, file descriptors are the way that, um, by the way, file descriptors are the way in which um, a Unix-based system will interact with a file. It is basically a way for, it is the, it is the key by which the, uh, the program can tell the operating system what file do I want to talk to. And so Windows has something called handles, which are kind of similar if you squint at them and ignore a lot of vulnerabilities and uh, deadlocking problems. Uh, which operating system deadlocking is another really cool thing uh, that I will rant about if no one asks. As a threat, if you don't answer, ask me questions, I will start talking about how operating systems deadlock um, and philosophers with spaghetti. <laughs> Please no, I have to do that later. I know. <laughs> and by later, I mean like tomorrow. Anyone else curious about operating system security? Why are we the way we are? Okay, cool. Oh, yep. Uh, I'm just like, uh, is there like a good security? I guess this isn't really like an operating system question, but yeah. like, I made a pitch about like a medical device. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering, like, what co sort of a possible security threat should I be aware of when developing it? No, that's a fantastic question. Uh, OS security has had a big invigoration with the dawn of the IoT and embedded movements recently in computing because we're sort of seeing a lot of the same problems that we ran into in the original, um, the original uh, OS spaces. And what I mean by that is as new people are starting to, to develop these systems, uh, people who might not be familiar with them much as the, the history of computer security, we see similar bugs. So for example, one of the biggest things you're going to want to worry about is you, what kind of input comes into this device. And it's, it's a little bit harder to think about for like, for example, a medical device. Because it seems like, oh, this thing, this thing will be fine. It's like inside of a person. But like, what really, so for example, um, there are plenty of biomedical devices that have been recently uh, brought out that you can connect to an app. You can connect wirelessly to them. You can start, you can monitor, like for example, uh, pacemakers. Pacemakers with a little bit of Bluetooth LTE. It's very low power. The thing can run for a long time. The app can connect to it. You can get a lot of useful information. That being said, if you connect to a Bluetooth LTE and you send it more data than the app is, so the, the application expects to get a certain like 64 byte chunks of data, 64 bytes at a time. So if you send it 65 bytes at a time, the thing crashes. Which, it's a computer, computers crash. Oh wait, it's a pacemaker. Ah! Uh, so to answer your question, I would mostly recommend look at what kind of input vectors the uh, thing can receive. So what, how do people interact with it? And then the next thing I would say is look at um, what kind of uh, interference could possibly be happening by, um, is it an internal device? No, it's an external, it's like a headset sort of, but like it reads like, a, it monitors like uh, outputs from the brain, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with regards to that, it's got a sensor on it that's picking up these brain waves. What happens if you send very weird data through that sensor? What happens if that sensor starts um, doing various like goes rogue or starts getting weird data sent through it uh can your program uh or can your device basically be like hey i'm not in a safe place right now either shut down if safe or if not safe alert the user in some way like hey i am under attack right now or i am malfunctioning right now you need to see a professional immediately Something like that would be uh, what I would recommend as the first place to go. And yeah, a lot of it in the medical space is being able to identify, can I turn off right now? Because the safest place for a device is turned off. And like, there's a reason why turn it off, turn it back on is such a big thing. Because if you turn something off and turn it back on, you kind of give it a really nice reset. But in the medical space, that's not always, again, if it's a pacemaker, you can't like reboot your pacemaker. pacemaker. I know it's not a pacemaker, but is it like something that can be, I don't know what it's doing. Can it be something that turns off? 
Yeah. So then, yeah, have it be basically able to be like, hey, I'm under attack. I'm going to reset now. Um, that's a, another, another big thing is don't be afraid of your thing. If your thing can reset, don't be afraid of resetting because that is a safer alternative than trying to keep going despite your inability to uh, act in an adverse environment. Yeah. What's up? So you talked a lot about like... Also, if people have to like go, because I know it's like 7 o'clock now. Oh, geez. Well... I mean, mobile operating systems. So, I mean, Android is Linux. Like, Android is just put same problems of Linux on top of Android, add limited battery and computing. So, again, you have these issues of, and a lot of the problems are like, okay, we have limited computing resources, so now we have to scale back something. What do we scale back? Do we scale back performance? And the user clearly notices and like gets like gets annoying. Do we scale back graphics where it looks a little bit worse? Or do we scale back security where the user will really only notice if like something goes wrong? Something probably won't go wrong. Uh, so the big thing with op mobile operating systems is things are going to go on the chopping block. Like you're going to lose some things off of the full power of desktop operating systems. So you really need to think about not when you're uh, using the. You need to think what. What is being traded off here? Like, am I trading at an equal performance for less security? And if you're on iOS, mm, who knows what's going on over there? Probably some Swift stuff. What's up? Um, so I'm on Spectre and Meltdown specifically, or OS vulnerabilities in general? So for the Spectre Meltdown specifically, I am going to reference you to a talk that is on our uh, White Hat page where we actually discuss the uh, in-depth details of, oh. <laughs> okay. Really? Okay. That was like. Yeah. That's a, no, it happens. Like. It's no, it hard hardware <laughs> doesn't work ever. Even with all the modern protections we've put on it, it still will detonate just randomly or things will happen to it. Hardware is a pain and I have so much respect for the people who like write drivers and have to deal with that on a regular basis. Okay, so this is just a very quick anecdote to prove that I really how weird hardware is. If you've ever written a hard disk driver, which is something you have to do if you take Operating Systems 2 at Cal Poly. It's um, being offered in spring. It is being offered in spring. Um, if you ever take Operating Systems 2, you'll learn that to read from a hard drive, you always need to read five times. Why five? Well, because a read takes about 100 milliseconds. And it takes about 500 milliseconds for the disk of, like, the, the thing on the physical spinning disk to get to the right place. So your first four reads might be just garbage. And it's only on the fifth read that you can be like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was actually the bite I was looking for. This is the kind of bullshit that happens with hardware. And, like, I... Uh, mad respect to all y'all who deal with it. I, I, I love uh, some of the stuff with it. Um, I find writing device drivers really cool. And I actually find those kinds of problems really interesting. But the things I find really interesting in hardware is, OK, how do I break it? Like, what, what, what do I do to this thing such that it falls over and does interesting stuff or gives me private keys? Um, what's up? Yeah, if you, that's the other thing. If you can get near hardware, you can like kick it. Oh my god, you can physically interact with this stuff? That's a pain to deal with security wise. Oh, that's a whole different like threat model of thinking about like, oh, you have like people and like, oh, whoa. Terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Oh, right. That was a very long. So, Spectre Meltdown was a vulnerability. Um, in Intel and AMD and ARM's Intel, AMD and ARM CPUs, and what it was was basically um, these CPUs, in order to eke out a little more processing, if they hit a very like 
expensive instruction, so an, uh, an assembly instruction that takes a long time, they will in the background start running other instructions. Like, and then once that one finishes, they were like, hey, look, I instantaneously did these other instructions magically. And what ended up happening was these out of order instructions had some physical effects on the disk or on the uh, chip. So it would cause certain, uh, certain small changes on the chip, uh, specifically with regards to the idea of caching, of how fast it is to get something on, like to read a number off of some device. And so because it had these small changes, you could read these small changes and determine which of those out of order instructions were run and what the results were. So what you could do is use that to basically, um, you could basically use that to run code that you would normally be uh, killed by the operating system for doing and get the results of it seconds before, like nanoseconds before you were killed by the operating system and store it somewhere. And because you were able to do this, you could very slowly reconstruct things that the OS would normally kill your program for. And so if you could just keep running this program over and over and over and doing these like few instructions, you could get, with Meltdown, you could literally get it such that I had one program running over here that was just reading the memory of a different program. So you could see like, oh look, there's my password when I type it into Firefox, or there's my Bitcoin private key when I put it into my Bitcoin wallet. These were like, and this is just on the same computer. There were variants of Meltdown that worked over the internet. So you could visit a JavaScript web page and that JavaScript web page would start meltdown processes and start feeding you information back. It was like a massive thing. And there was like nothing for this. Like Intel was like, ah, that's, well, actually they didn't even admit it was a bug at first. They just sort of sat there for a bit and they're like, hmm, that's a thing right there. Well, that's unfortunate. They're like, I guess buy a new CPU or something. Pay us more money to develop the same security level products. Yeah, so that's what Spectre Meltdown was. And uh, if you want a less, like, that was a very condensed version. I gave like an hour talk on this. If you would like a more expanded version, come chat with me in the White Hat Lab. I'm almost always there. I'd love to talk more about it. Or if you want to learn about why Minix is the most common operating system in the world, more than Linux, Windows, and Macintosh combined. Intel. Intel. Intel? Yes. Minix runs on every Intel CPU. Why did they say Minix was so So Minix was written to be what's called a teaching operating system. So the whole point of it is that it can be very easily taken apart and put together and changed. The result of that is as a performance operating system, so something you're actually trying to use, it is very slow. The code is often very repetitive because it's specifically designed for people who are going to like, it was designed like, so the operating systems book that we use here, in the back of it, is literally printed the source code of Minix. So it was designed to be, yeah, yeah, you get the whole source code of Minix printed in the back of the book. Because it was back when you couldn't just have like a nice Minix terminal just sitting there. You had to go to the freaking uh, machine room, go sit down, like connect to our equivalent of the CSL or whatever, and be like, yes. Sign me into the Minix machine. I have to do my OS homework. Oh no, everyone's doing their OS homework because it's the night of the project. Ah, go, I don't know, eat a, whatever they ate in the 1990s. No, did, there wasn't like a food of the 90s or something. I don't know, go watch an episode of Drake and Josh or something. That was the early 2000s. I don't know. Go watch Hey Arnold. Right, thank you.